Hello, and thank you all for joining us today for our webinar, uh, Sharing Omeka in the Web of Digital Scholarship. Before we get started, uh, just a few logistical things. This webinar will be recorded and made accessible shortly. So you should all receive a follow-up email at some point with a link to the online version or the recorded version. Uh, additionally, you will see a chat feature in the lower left of the screen. This chat is being monitored and you can use this to ask questions as we go along. We will have some time, uh, we'll look at the agenda in just a moment, uh, for a discussion or a Q&A kind of at the end. So feel free to ask questions as we go. Um, moving along, uh, this is our agenda for today. Um, so we'll begin with a brief introduction, uh, followed by some information about the pilot project. We'll get into results of the pilot project and then that discussion or Q&A that I mentioned before. So our presenters today, uh, I am Cynthia Hudson Vitali. I'm the Head of Digital Scholarship and Data Services at Penn State University. Um, we have uh, Michael Roth with us as well. Um, Michael is the NEH-funded SHARE intern with Penn State University Libraries. He is the former Digital Scholarship Lab Coordinator at Fenwick Library with George Mason University. And he recently received his master's degree in applied history from George Mason and a graduate certificate in digital public, li uh, digital public humanities. He also has a master's degree in education and multimedia from California State Polytechnic University. Um, also speaking today, you will hear from Dr. Heather Froelich. She is the Literary Informatics Librarian at Penn State University. She received her PhD uh, from the University of Strathclyde, where she studied representations of social identity in Shakespeare and other early modern London plays. Before that, she studied English and linguistics at the University of New Hampshire. And finally, facilitating the Q&A, we have Judy Rutenberg, who is the Program Director for Strategic Initiatives at the Association of Research Libraries. So, uh, just to provide a little bit of background about um, SHARE. So SHARE is a free and open data set or a database and a set of tools that aggregates metadata about research and scholarship uh, across the research life cycle. So more than just publications, SHARE includes information and metadata about funders, about funding, um, data sets, code, preprints, and more. And it harvests, normalizes, stores, links, and allows individuals to query and build off it, um, given its open nature, of course. So in September of 2017, SHARE received a planning grant from the National Endowment of the Humanities uh, to investigate requirements for scholars to, uh, to link all the components of their work, for librarians to have a means to accurately track usage of all the components of a DH project, for scholars and students to quickly find the relevant scholarship and primary sources they need, and for new project leaders to quickly gain an understanding of all the existing content and tools at their disposal. And to, um, to address these goals, we took a sort of mixed method approach. We began with a survey of DH researchers and content creators to understand the current state of DH projects. Uh, we held a <coughs> workshop with DH stakeholders to wireframe solutions to common um, DH stewardship issues. And then we also conducted on-campus focus groups with DH centers to really dig into DH discovery and access requirements. And today we'll be reporting out on a prototype that has developed for this project, and Heather will be giving us more details shortly. So this is the project team for the larger um, NEH grant. It includes myself, Judy Rutenberg, Matthew Harp uh, from Arizona State University, uh, Joanne Patterson at Western, and Rick, uh, Rick Johnson at the University of Notre Dame, and Jeffrey Spies at 221B Consulting. And I should acknowledge that um, SHARE has been around since uh, approximately 2013, 2014. Um, and it was through, or it's been through the generous sponsorship um, provided by the Alfred Brees Sloan Foundation the and the Institute of Museum and Library Services, and most recently this planning grant through the National Endowment for the Humanities. 
So with that, I am going to turn it over to uh, Heather to mm -hmm. um, dig into to lead us off. Great. Thanks, Cynthia. Um, so as many of us know, the discoverability of DH assets is both distributed and difficult. There's lots of platforms. Um, previous attempts have represented various forms of failure. Some of you will be familiar with, for example, the TAPOR and DIRT directories. Uh, lots of these kind of become, let's call them graveyards of projects that are hard to maintain. And when we were talking about what we wanted to do specifically with this project, we really wanted to focus our attentions on just one platform and just one issue, seeing how there's a whole range of projects in which digital humanities can cover. Uh, and in doing so, we really wanted to focus specifically on a project like Omeka, which is widely adopted by a number of different uh, DH practitioners doing, and non-DH practitioners as well, doing a variety of different things. Uh, and we also really were curious about how we could make this both scalable, exportable, as well as generalizable, customizable, multilingual, and in case that wasn't enough, just to kind of put in a sort of level of a graphical user interface that almost anyone could use at a very low price point. So I, you know, free to use, perhaps free as in beer, but also free as in something that would be accessible to the widest variety of people. So um, one of our first questions for you is, uh, oh, I've lost the question. Here we go. Our first question for you is, are you currently using any of the following content management systems? Uh, and we have options including Omeka, WordPress, Drupal, Joomla, Canvas, Moodle, Blackboard, or any other sort of similar object, Jekyll, other. And I believe that voting is open. Is voting open? Amy, do we need to reset the question? I'm, I'm attempting to do that. We may need okay. to ask people to, um, to answer the responses in the chat rather than but um, give me a minute to try to reset the poll. Okay. This would not be a digital humanities event if something didn't go wrong, so you're all welcome <laughs> to that fun moment. <laughs> One second. Someone can hum the Jeopardy song to themselves. <laughs> Okay, Heather, if you go to the next slide, you should see the poll again, and I apologize for the Okay, for the yeah, prompt. no problem. Here we go. So if we could please quickly vote on if we're using any of the following content management systems, and you're welcome to choose more than one here. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll in a second. So final call for votes. All right. Well, thank you all very much. That's really interesting. You can see that uh, Canvas Moodle Blackboard is far and away the most popular with Drupal in a very close second. Hmm. Fascinating. Okay. Well, now that we know that, I think at this point we're going to uh, – hand this one over to Michael to tell us about what he's been doing about scraping Omeka projects. And Michael, are you ready? Yep. Okay. okay. Michael, take it away. So um, so once again, I am Michael Ross. Um, I am the NEH Chair intern here working for how to scrape Omeka projects. So um, I personally was drawn to Omeka um, as a grad student at George Mason. Um, 
when I was studying history because it allowed me to organize a bunch of different digitized artifacts into one location and then exhibit them alongside any content that I found. And what I like about it is that you can have all these artifacts with their metadata attached to them along, and then still have all the narrative content along with it. So um, the system has been widely adopted. As you saw, about a third of you, your responses um, say that you have used the Mac or are currently using it. So um, one of the problems that I found was that um, Omeka's website has a fairly uh, comprehensive list of projects, but um, it, it's at this point, it's just the, the title and a brief one-line description. So um, for me, there was a way, I needed to find a way of extracting a more descriptive information about the projects, um, not just the title, but anything on its about page, any contributors, rights information, all that sort of thing. And to do this, um, we decided to focus on uh, two uh, web scrapers that use um, HTML and CSS to, um, to extract information from live websites. Uh, the first one is called Parse Hub. Um, it is a downloadable application for Mac and PC. And the second one is called webscraper.io which is a Chrome browser extension that can be installed onto any, anyone who has the Chrome browser. And um, what I like about both of these is that both are, have free to use options um, and they also have um, very detailed documentation and forms to help with any issues that might arise. So um, our first step was to find um, a wide range of Omeka projects that we could use to test those two systems. So um, our goal with that was to, to see what are, A, what's out there, and B, to gather ones that have um, different um, styles of organization or um, different elements for presenting the data. So um, we found four main types. Uh, the first is um, exhibit space. Which tended, which as a historian, that's what I'm used to, which is a lot of content and um, that use items to help um, visualize what, um, visualize the narrative that's being presented. The second most common were uh, collections based, which tend to be special collections or archives or anyone that has a wide range of artifacts that they just want to post publicly for people to come and find. Um, a third lesser known, or not known, but um, ones that are use maps as their main uh, viewpoint and focus, which um, they tend to use um, a map as the main layer, and then you click on different elements that bring up an item or other content. Uh, and the fourth one that we found um, sporadically are uh, sites that are built by university professors, and those main are mainly for students to come in and learn how to input items or just generally learn the system, what Omeka does, and just get their feet wet for what um, a digital humanity tool does. And for our purposes, we decided to focus on uh, the collection and, and exhibit-based sites mostly because they tended to have a well-developed project with enough variety within them to test how those elements affected the web scraping. So uh, these are the two that I tested the most. Um, the first is uh, Color Conventions, which is uh, still being updated. Um, so it's very much active and alive. Um, it, it's a fairly straightforward site from an HTML standpoint. It, um, it focuses on a bunch of conventions from of free blacks during the 1800s. And it's really centered around um, the documentation that was generated during these conventions. And uh, most of the information is organized into individual items. But it also has a large number of exhibits that help provide context for them. And 
um, just help discuss the topics that were um, that are in these conventions. And the second one that we uh, tested is the Florida Memory Site. Um, it is currently the main website for the Florida State Library and Archives, and it organizes a little differently. Um, it has six main thumbnails on the homepage, half of which are specific media types. And then within those, you have um, um, project, other projects within them, like exhibits and collections. So it's a, a bit more complicated in that sense in that you have all these different branching websites. And then these are just two um, other examples. Um, the building history is an example of one that's map based. Um, for this screenshot, um, the one in yellow is the one that I clicked on. And as you can see in the top right corner, it brings up a couple of photographs and information about that building. And then the Gothic Pass website is actually presented by the University of Dublin. So um, I like that one because it, it has a, a wide range of both collections and exhibits. And um, these are just some of the other um, websites that I found that I tested certain things in the scrapers for, um, as well as on this next slide, some more. Um, and all these are links. So if, uh, once you have the presentation, you can go and look at these, just see what they're like. All right, and we have our next question. Do. Uh... Okay, so we're wondering, do you guys include any of the following information on your DH project sites, including license for reuse, data type, the temporal span of the project, funder, open accessibility, and resources reused, codes, APIs, other options are available. We'll leave this open for a minute or two. So we have a question which is we're not sure what we mean exactly by open accessibility and we're thinking kind of more broadly along the lines of um, open access resources, uh, ways in which you got different kinds of data, things like that. I think you can be very broad in that answer. Okay. All right. Should we close the poll? Is everyone ready? All right. Let's see. So it looks like license for your use is quite big. Um, information about funding is quite big. Um, interestingly, open accessibility, which quite broad, is also quite high up there. And data type is also obviously quite important as well. So, hmm. All right. That's interesting framing for what's going to happen next. So I'm going to give it back to Michael at this point. Uh, and Michael, ready? Yep. Okay. All right. All right, so um, once we decided um, what projects we wanted to use for testing, um, we needed to go in and actually set up um, how to extract the information. So like I said in the intro, um, we came across both ParseHub and WebScraper.io. Um, both systems um, utilize uh, sitemaps, which is basically the umbrella that holds these things called selectors. And selectors are the things that tell the scrapers what to do. 
So normally it's saying, I want you to extract this particular text or click on this link or scroll down the page, things like that. And um, with Parsub, it's, uh, some of the benefits with this is that it's free to use. It's a very friendly uh, user interface, so it's easy to find buttons and selectors. Um, it's easy to add some individual information to the selectors. And then once you're done and you've scraped the data, you can export everything either as a CSV file, file or a JSON. Um, there are, however, some drawbacks to this. Um, on the free version, you can only have five total projects at one time. And um, the other caveat is that since it's on the free version, um, they can theoretically be viewed publicly on their servers by anyone else who is using Parsub. So there is some issue with um, copyright or privacy issues that might come into play. Um, another thing is um, Parsub runs on um, templates within the sitemap, which typically translate to a specific web page. So you'd have one template for the home page and another template for an about page, and then a third one for a collections page, and so on. And getting them to talk to each other just to make sure that each page is getting scraped um, can get a little confusing. Um, so it's just that's one of the less usability things with Parsub. And then also that the export file um, doesn't have as much information, and navigating through it is um, a little confusing as well. It, so, um, so this is just a view of um, loading up Parsub. So for this one, um, it's my uh, sitemap for the Color Conventions website. So it has the project you're working on um, as the, the big window, so you can see what you're doing. Then off to the left is um, the templates on all the selectors, so you can see what you've done and which one you're working on. And then on the bottom window, if you have one of your selectors are, um, already clicked on, it gives you just a brief uh, view of what information it's looking at. And then um, just to give more example of what a selector is, um, it, um, with this window, you get to it by clicking on the plus button saying you want to add a selector. And you have all these different options for uh, Parsub. So you can say, I want you to select this information, or I want you to click on this, or hover over something. So each one of those becomes its own selector in the sitemap. And um, one of the main issues with the templates is since each page has their own, usually at the end of a template, you have to add a selector telling it to go to another template. That's really the only way to get make sure that the uh, system will go to the entire website and scrape all the information that you want. And um, this is one thing I like about Parsub is if it sees that it's a list of things, like uh, usually with uh, links, uh, like for here it's um, a list of items. It could be anything from an ex a list of exhibits or a list of items. Uh, if you click on the first one, it will register the rest of the list. And you can, if you want to select everything, you would just click on the, the main text of the next one and it will select all of them. Or if you wanted to go one by one, you could either click on the X or the check mark to say, yes, I want it, or no, I don't. And just go through the list saying which ones that you want. All right, so once you have your sitemap built, um, you have to actually tell what, tell the scraper to go ahead and scrape the information. Um, Parsehub does have a way to test the templates just to make sure everything is set up right. So um, you can do the, the first box, the blue one, you say just go ahead and test them and it will go through all of your templates just to make sure it, um, it's there. And um, once that's all set up, um, sorry about that, someone's doing hard work. Um, so once you have your sitemap already built, um, you, could, you would hit the run button, and that's what tells Parsehub to, um, 
to go through and actually extract the information. All right, so um, once we were done with um, going through Parse Hub, we moved on to uh, WebScraper.io. Um, like I said, like Parse Hub, it is a free to use extension of Chrome, but um, it does not limit how many projects you have. So you, um, you can have as many as 50 different projects going at one time if you want to build that many. Um, and so um, one thing that I, I like about it is that if you, uh, you can add multiple levels of HTML. So say you have a title of an exhibit followed immediately by a description that it might be listed as like a header tag followed by a paragraph tag. You can tell the system to grab both of those at one time. And also, um, it lets the um, when you select a link, it will pull not just the name of the link, but also the URL, and it will give you both in separate columns in the um, exported file. Um, one drawback is that it it the HTML is very present in the selectors. So if you're not really familiar with what uh, with HTML, um, it can get a little confusing. So this is just um, another screenshot of a sitemap that I built. Um, so you can see in the second column here that that is the specific code that it's pulling from this website. So um, and each each column is is just gives you some piece of information. So, um, hey, Michael, do you want to like yeah. hand over yeah. the slides for a minute so you can take care of your puppy? Your yeah, dog? yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. He's usually very quiet. <laughs> All good. Heather, do you want to take over for a few minutes? Uh, Heather, I think you're still muted if you're trying to talk. Sorry, folks. Yep, sorry about that. I forgot I muted myself. Um, so Michael really dove into Web Scraper IO. As you can see, he found out that he was able to select multiple tags, including paragraph tags, H3, other ones. Um, and you can do multiple instances of each one in, in every selector. Um, there's a set selector for the next page button, so projects that include exhibits, items, collections of stuff that are spread over multiple pages can be accounted for in sort of aggregate. Um, and images are recorded as URLs, so any information within the image that are not scraped, sorry, any information within the images are not scraped is only what appears in the HTML code, so it would only take the URL for each individual image source. Um, so this is just to say that it's a slightly more robust version of what we were just um, hearing about with the Parse Hub. Uh, and as you can see, the Web Scraper IO selectors let you do a little bit more granular kind of work. And so I don't know if you can see very clearly, but there's you know different levels of information that you can include here. Um, where are we? Right. There's also something called the selector graph, which is a way to kind of visualize the hierarchy of selectors. And here's an example that Michael's created from the Gothic Past page. Um, and it covers a variety of different levels, so you can kind of visualize at what level different metadata can be extracted. Um, and you can see that you know there's a root which you could call like the main website, and then there's a variety of different levels within that. Um, yes. Sorry, I'm just looking at my notes here to make sure I'm getting all the correct information to you guys. Uh, yes. Okay. So when we export data, both Parse Hub and Web Scraper IO exports data as a CSV, um, and the selector label or the ID, depending on which program we're using, becomes the column headers. And the Parse Hub and Web Scraper IO both organizes the CSV file slightly differently, which is of course an issue for us as a sort of aggregation problem. Um, in particular, the Parse Hub CSV data separates the templates into different blocks, and each template is at the bottom and to the right of the previous template, which I understand is hard to visualize, so thankfully there's an image of that on the next page. Um, Michael, are you back? Okay. I'm, yeah, I'm back. 
Sorry. Okay. okay. We've we'll just made it to the end of slide 35. Okay. Yeah. So we just talked right, a little bit about blocks. That's my note. That's fine. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Yeah. Okay. So, um, all right. So um, since ParseHub uses templates as its main building block, the data is um, organized in the same way. So each of these blocks is its own template. So, um, so this first one would be like the home, all the information scraped from the home page, and then um, the second block, which starts at row 34 and column F, looks like that's everything on the exhibits page, and they would just continue to build like that for the rest of the template. So it's a little confusing, and because it's not, um, since it's all these blocks with a bunch of white space in between them. And um, webscaper.io does it um, by hierarchy. Uh, this is where that selector graph comes into play because um, anything on the, the level with root tends, is, comes first in the columns, and those get those ones get copied for each row. So um, and so anything that comes after those ones will get tacked on to the right. So um, I do have another um, screenshot because it is a little confusing. Um, so um, it starts out with um, the information from the actual sitemap. So it tells you when it scrapes that particular row and where the website that it started at. And then it goes into whatever selectors were on that first page. So for this one, it would be the creative work, which is like the title and the project about information, and then it would delve into anything that was linked to that, like the contributors page, or uh, and then to a contact page, and so on. So this one, it builds to the left is the first little dots in that window, and then at, to the right, it's those extra dots that branch out from that. So uh, once we um, tested both of these um, systems, we um, gathered our thoughts about what we liked about each. And um, we decided at this point um, to use webscraper.io mostly because we weren't limited in terms of how many projects we could use. And there was no issue about privacy or any of that. And then it also, um, you get so much more information on that export file that for us it, it really gave us all the information we could use. Right. Okay, I'm back with another question in case you're tired of hearing from me yet. Uh, what do you guys think the necessary next steps for a DH project aggregator would be? And we have options including prioritizing Omeka sites for harvest, uh, developing community standards, uh, metadata curation and remediation, scaling to larger DH projects beyond Omeka, and E other. We're open to suggestions on what other could be. Okay, just another minute here, very quickly. All right, let's see what the responses are. 
developing community standards is very high up there, followed really closely by meta curation, metadata curation and remediation. Interesting. Um, with I think scaling to larger DEH projects seems to be in third place. All right. Michael, are you ready for the next slide? Yeah. All right. Yep. Take it away. Okay. So at this point, um, we decided to um, focus on generating a metadata dictionary um, just for us to use from that point forward. Um, and this was really to create a standardized list of terms for us to use um, within these scrapers. So um, it, it really involved comparing um, the share schema along with what we found in these projects. And since Omeka uses Dublin Core for a lot of its creation, it was also seeing what was common between all three of those, and as well as ones that um, didn't appear in one. So um, what we did was once we had our list of terms, we um, created a, a definition of them, like what's the title, what is the description, uh, and what we found was there were some uh, duplication as well as some that don't have a direct translation. Like there are some of the ones that got duplicated were like, um, like um, title and description because those appear not only in the overall project, but within an exhibit or within a collection or within items. Um, and other things that we came across were some were not quite obvious about their definition, like at what point is an organization a contributor or is a, con or if we could flip that around, is a contributor also part of an over a larger organization? So, um, and also since items are, are their own thing really, um, they have their own set of metadata embedded within them. So we had to figure out what to do with that. And um, the last thing was we um, had to add anything that we missed, like, um, I think I have that here on. Okay, so, um, so this is basically um, what our dictionary looks like. So we started off with the higher level information. Um, for us, the share term for a title was creative work. So that became our consistent word for that higher level of information. And then anything underneath that became a project. And that includes both collections and exhibits. And then we also wanted to provide an example from our scrapes just to give more of a concrete explanation of a real world, real world application. So for each one, like for a title, we um, and put a title. For a description, we put in a description just so we were clear about which one we were talking about. And um, once that was completed, um, we had a couple updates to the scrapers. First of all, we had to change any of the terminology that was already entered into the web scraper. So um, that it was mostly changing titles. Um, like from whatever was in the project itself to this metadata dictionary. Uh, there were a few that we, I didn't add initially, like a publisher or any rights information. So it was going back and adding any of those terms that hadn't been scraped yet. And then um, once we were finished with all of our metadata, um, we had a couple updates to the overall project. Um, the first of which was we decided to focus only on the upper levels of information. Um, this means not trying to scrape items or any content. Um, this was just uh, to help manage the amount of information we were getting, as well as more of a time management. Um, mostly because the, the amount of time it takes to scrape an entire website went up dramatically. Um, once we added all the um, the items, each scrape took about 15 to 20 minutes for it to scrape all the information. And this was up to up from about a minute or two at most for just pulling the titles and descriptions. 
and it helped us keep everything manageable in terms of the information. Um, it helped us get rid of some of the duplicates in terms of like titles and descriptions. And uh, during all this, we had um, a question on in the back of our minds about what happens if the project is not English. So um, what I found in trying to figure out what happens is Chrome can give a rough translation of any foreign language. So um, once you have the browser translate the page, you can set up a web script for IO sitemap as any other English website. So, uh, so that the process of it doesn't change. And what we found was um, once we went to extract it, it kept the original language. So um, if once you enter in your information about the selectors, um, it, Chrome will keep, will not translate any page unless you specifically tell it to. So when the scraper goes in to load the page for scraping, it's still in that original language. And um, there were a few general problems along the way. Um, the most pressing was when we transitioned to the metadata dictionary, um, the exhibits and collections pages got combined into one term. So it was um, a little bit of head scratching trying to figure out how to set a selector to go to both pages. Um, so what we found was um, this thing called ENT of type code, which I believe is CSS. Um, it, the rest paper IO will let you type in that code into the selector. And it basically says, I, it says to the scraper, I want you to go to this page and this page and not the other one. Um, unfortunately, that doesn't really work for these more complicated sites. Um, as I said in the beginning, um, Florida Memory, those top three thumbnails each have at least two other links. So um, that right off the bat, you have six different pages to link to. So um, that the, it, that really confuses the, the web scraper. So the solution that we came up with was to keep everything separate. So each page would have its own um, unique name. And then once it's exported using um, a data cleaning software like OpenRefine to collapse those columns under the one term. And um, this is just to show you how complex um, that Florida memory project is in the scraper because uh, you have the main page that has eight different selectors on it, and then half of those, more than half, have other links to it. So for our naming stru um, structure, we started off saying, this is a project, and then having an underscore saying, okay, what kind of information is this? So it became project underscore photograph or project underscore audio, and then just tacking on more specific information to the end as the scraper was built up. And then another issue that we came across was um, in trying to scrape images. Um, it's more common with logos of organizations because um, if you're trying to figure out who helped uh, create the project, the organizations um, are really helpful for that. So the problem is they usually only provide a logo which doesn't have its own textual information. And the scraper, can only see the URL or HTML information. So if that's all you need, that's great. You can just go in and say, I want you to get the HTML code for that image. If you need the specific text within that, the scrapers can't really do that. So you would have to um, manually download out those images outside of the scraper and to use an OCR software that can read that text. So another issue with images is that um, sometimes, or about half the time really, they're also set as links to those organizations. 
which can also confuse the web scraper. So um, the solution I found is when you're going in and uh, setting up the selector, you need to set those as a link selector rather than an image because that will tell it to say this is a link rather than this is an image and that can give you the same information as any other link. Now, in terms of um, expanding this into other non-Omeka projects, um, since both ParseHub and WebScraper IO use HTML and CSS, it, in theory, can scrape any public website. So it, those of you that use Drupal or WordPress, or any of those, it should be able to load those projects and you can select the information that you want from those websites. And um, so it, the only thing to keep in mind is that those do organize their data differently than Omeka. So um, just be aware of that when you're creating your sitemaps and extracting your data. Uh, just Keep an eye on your terminology. Um, if you have a schema already built, use that whenever possible. Or if you don't, just have, um, just keep it consistent throughout your sitemaps. And if you're using more than, more than one project, try to keep everything the same wherever you can. And, um, you know, this. Our focus for this project was just to get this top level informa of information. It doesn't have to. Uh, if you want to scrape just the items and collections, as, um, it can do that fairly easily. Uh, just be aware of any copyright information or if it's, or just to keep aware of that legality. Um, and one thought that I had through all this was um, if you wanted to create an archive of the final iteration, you can or if you want to see how one project progressed through its creation, you can set up, you can set up your sitemap along the way as you're building the project and periodically do a scrape just to see how the informa information changed throughout its life cycle. Right. Okay, thank you very much, Michael. Um, before we get to questions, we have a question for all of you. Uh, which is, after hearing this webinar, what support do you guys all think the DH community needs most? Is it A, recommendations on how to abandon, how to handle abandoned digital humanities projects in, for example, Omeka, WordPress, other HTML sites, etc.? cetera? Uh, B, best practices for scaling the production, stewardship, and project lifecycle of DH projects more generally? Is it project management strategies? Or is it D, assessing methods for digital humanities project success, value, and or impact? And for this one, we're going to make you choose something. So if you could all head to the polls. Okay, we've got 26 votes. All right, in the interest of having a lively discussion, we're going to close the poll in a second. Last call. Wow, okay, far and away the question of uh, value and impact is very clearly the highest. Hmm. With the recommendations on how to handle abandoned projects coming basically tied with project management strategies. So it sounds like this is a very divided audience. Very interesting. Okay, well, at this point, I think we would like to thank you all very much, and we'd like to open the floor to questions. Uh, if you can please type those into the little chat box, we will have those sent to us, and I believe Judy is going to read them to us. Yes, and we thank will discuss you so them. much for that uh, wonderful presentation and a and very grateful handoff uh, uh, and, and teamwork. So thank you very much for... Um, for a terrific presentation. We do have a couple of questions queued up already, so and they are for anyone on, on your team, I think, to answer. Um, with respect to um, uh, providing community guidance for metadata standards, the question is, are we talking about uh, digital project-level metadata 
that is laid on top of a project's existing metadata standards, for example, for Omeka, on top of DCMI and VRA core. Uh, this is Cynthia. I can take that question. Yes, so um, we were interested in getting a lot of the descriptive metadata about uh, a project uh, at the high level. So um, as Michael sort of outlined in some of the earlier slides uh, there, we were interested in um, getting information that would map to the share metadata schema. So again, it's, it's the share metadata schema is heavily based on data sites, so it can get very granular. But um, for this instance, it was just looking at um, some very high-level information about the project overall, which was in many cases distributed across many pages within an Omeka site. Is there anything else anybody else wants to add? Okay, um, thank you, Cynthia. We also have a question um, uh, with respect to the scraping of, or the having to manually uh, download images. Um, shouldn't all the logos for funders have alt text? Otherwise, um, it represents an accessibility fail, and isn't this something that Omeka site creators need to be aware of? All right, I'll take this one. Um, theoretically, yes, they should all have alternate text but um, not all the projects I found um, took the time to do that. So um, it's, what I found is um, those who are, the projects that were aware of it usually had the alternate text on all their images, and those that didn't enter anywhere um, usually didn't, they usually didn't have any alternate text at all throughout the entire project. So it could be a matter of those creators not being aware that it's an option. So, okay, and um, this, yeah. Anything else? Okay. Um, so we also have a question here on, um, what is, this is interesting, what is the added value in web scraping over sharing projects on GitHub? For example, if all of your code and assets are in one spot, and GitHub uh, sharing the GitHub by share, um, maybe the OSS. So, uh, where does the um, how, how does the where, where's the value in the in the web scraping? Um, I think the value in the web scraping is that um, it's currently not a norm to put code and assets all in one spot. Um, what we found when we did our survey is that, um, as we suspected, people put their different assets in different places. Um, and so um, going to each of those places to retrieve them is, is often necessary to show the entire life cycle of the project. Um, it would be great if everybody kept things in one place, um, but um, as it is, things are, are highly distributed or again, lock down on one small website, or one big website. Okay, thank you. Um, then uh, uh, one more question in the queue, and we've got a couple minutes if there are more. Um, what are the tools used or planned to be, what tools are um, being planned um, to be used for analyzing the scrape data? So an analysis isn't really like a, a next step. What I think we are looking at as far as next steps is trying to then map and ingest this into the shared data set so that it's um, discoverable and then potentially linkable with other assets that are already there. So um, we don't have anybody from the, the um, highly technical side of the share project um, on the call today, I don't think. Um, but the, they do have uh, community calls regularly where they, they discuss the, the future technical developments and, and those sorts of things. So as far as next steps for this project, that's, that's where it's headed next. 
And one thing for me that would be quite interesting, I think, would be looking for similarities across lots of different kinds of websites, different kinds of projects. You know, what are what are consistent across lots of different kinds of digital humanities projects? Um, and I imagine that would be something to kind of observe at scale rather than at an individual level too. Michael, do you want to add anything? Um, not really. I mean, I, I liked Heather's idea about seeing the trends over a wide swath of projects just to see what's similar and what's different, and just seeing if there's any differences between the exhibit space and the collection space, just to see what sort of story these different types are telling. Great. Well, thank you all um, so much to our um, Michael, uh, Heather, and Cynthia for a wonderful presentation. Um, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Uh, the, this webinar, as Cynthia indicated, will be uh, has been recorded and will be um, made available. So I um, just want to want to thank you again for sharing such a wonderful project with us today.